international organized crime has no natural predator. Crime syndicates are expanding and forging alliances across the globe. As law enforcement struggle to stop them, up to 5% of the global economy is now in criminal hands. I'm Paul Radu, and for the past 20 years, I have investigated international organized crime in the tune of 400 billion. And this is a very, very small slice of what's really going on. I think there are some people. Let's go, let's go. In this series, I'm working with a team of reporters around the world. Are you angry with yourself for, for being part of this? To discover how a generation of international gangs are redrawing the criminal map. Cocaine seizures in Europe have reached record levels. Britain is at the epicenter with the highest number of users. Khalid Udin was described as pivotal to a cocaine distribution operation which sourced large quantities of the drug from Albanian smugglers. A British government report in 2020 found the cocaine market here is dominated by Albanian gangs whose supply network stretches across British towns and cities. Albanian national Errol Mema sourced and distributed deliveries of cocaine. I want to know how a small country on the southeast edge of Europe with a population of just 2.8 million is able to supply Europe's biggest market. To see how widely their cocaine distribution network has spread, I'm starting my investigation with the upper echelons of British society. I was asked to wear a suit tonight because we've been invited to an illegal elite mansion party in central London. We were invited by some members of the Bullingdon Club, which is an elite drinking club at Oxford University that counts David Cameron, Boris Johnson, a slew of prime ministers amongst its ranks. We're pretty certain that there's gonna be cocaine there. Londoners consume half a million lines of cocaine a day, twice as much as any other European city, making it a highly lucrative market for cocaine cartels. One floor up is the sex room, apparently. We're not allowed to film up there for obvious reasons. And then here is the one room that we're allowed to film in for the rest of the night. So do you use cocaine? I do indeed. How much of that do you think you'll use in a night? Oh, I could go through maybe two grabs for myself. If you were to order cocaine right now, how quickly would it arrive? I'd say 25 minutes. <laughs> you got someone who's on time, eh? Who do you buy it from? I have an Albanian friend that I go to. Albanian? Yes. What's different about him compared to other dealers? Ooh, so much more efficient. It's not just wealthy Londoners buying from Albanians. The gangs have expanded their territory so fast, they've had to recruit teenagers to move their product throughout the suburbs. When I was like 13, 14, I wanted to help my mum out with rent sort of thing. We were like dragged into it by some Albanians. That's how I got into it first, really. There's always Albanian gangs about. There's like a 24-7 service. You call them up any time of the day. They'll come drop you, just give them the address. It's not McDonald's, but for drugs. As well as selling straight to users, They've also taken over the wholesale distribution of cocaine to the trap houses that local gangs use to cut it and wash it into crack. They've uh, cornered the market at the moment. If you cross them, they're going to use violence. Kidnapping, taken away and not to be returned again, they'll just make you disappear. This reputation for violence is no rumor. On the streets of East London, a gang called the Hellbanians are ready for war. These drill music videos made for the Halbanians aren't empty threats. Several members not seen here have been sentenced to life for cocaine supply and armed assault. Despite their craving for views on YouTube, their lyrics show they're incredibly secretive. Our fixer is, is, I've spoken to him, he's here. He reckons that that's them. I guess we just have to keep waiting. All right, peace. We spent weeks trying to meet with the Albanian gangs in Britain, 
arranging clandestine nighttime meetings in backstreet car parks. One of them came very close to one of our vans, shined their lights into our vans, looked at us for about 40 seconds, and then zoomed off, and then all of the cars zoomed off. So what I'm thinking might have happened is these gangs are paranoid and they do their own kind of counter surveillance. The gangs follow an ancient code of honor called BESA, which forbids them from speaking to outsiders. If you violate BESA, there will be effects of that back in Albania. Someone with your family will be hurt. It's absolute control for them because you'll always have family and Albania is a small country and everybody knows everybody and you don't want your family to be at risk because of your actions somewhere abroad. Albania, being one of the poorest countries in Europe, bred some of the most violent crime in Europe. This is how you keep on projecting strength through violence, and that's key to organized crime, for people to be afraid of them. If the London-based Albanian gangs are impossible to infiltrate, maybe their suppliers in Colombia will speak to me. So I'll put you in touch with someone who's going to meet you in Medellin. It's 3 a.m. in London, and we've just managed to make contact with someone very high up in the Clan del Golfo, which is Colombia's biggest drug trafficking organization. And he's the one who deals directly with the Albanian Mafia, so we're going to give him a call. What's the relationship between the Clan del Golfo and the Albanian Mafia? Are they different to other clients? Seven tons of cocaine every few weeks. That's like almost eight billion dollars worth of cocaine every year just to the Albanian mafia. Those are the major exporters of drugs. So are there Albanian criminal members in Colombia who the clan deals with? Sí, claro, aquí en Colombia hay albaneses. El estado de la droga que sí se ha que se sabe en pura. Los albaneses se caracterizan por ser muy sangrientos, ¿sí? Y si alguien se le mete en sus terrenos, ellos acaban con todo lo que haya en el, en el camino. No les importa acabar con una familia completa. 70% of the world's cocaine is still produced in Colombia, and the Clan del Golfo control most of it. A right-wing paramilitary group, the U.S. government has designated them as one of the top five transnational organized crime gangs in the world. For the first time ever, they've given a film crew full access to their international trafficking operation. They hope showing their power and global reach will help them secure a peace deal with the Colombian government. The clan have told us they have everyone from commercial pilots to staff in Colombian air traffic control on their payroll. Officially, this private cargo plane is making a legitimate flight from Bogota to Caracas, but the clan have ordered it to stop at a clandestine airfield. Their cargo must cross the border in time for an onward shipment to Europe. The Colombian military have a shoot-down policy for narco planes, so the pilots can only switch off their radar transponder for a few minutes before it looks suspicious. Rapidito y concentrado, como no ven la luz verde con la puerta, 
The clan have 3,000 sworn in members who coordinate dozens of these flights every week to feed our global demand for cocaine. The United States have spent over $1 trillion on the war on drugs, much of it in Colombia. The DEA have downed Escobar and the Cali cartel, but cocaine production is still going up. Paul Radu spent two years in Colombia investigating the cartels. In terms of the economics of cocaine, the impact was zero, and even it was the reverse of what the DEA intended, because what Escobar did, and with the other cartels, was they presented the world with the proof that this is a lucrative industry, that this is worth getting into, that this is real business. Clan del Golfo is one of the most successful uh, Colombian criminal organizations right now because they've understood that they can infiltrate politics in a way that's different than what Escobar tried, right? Escobar tried to be not only the, you know, the, the leader of the cartel, they want, he wanted to be the face of the cartel, he wanted everything, he wanted too much. And these people are a lot more low-key. They are operating you know, behind the scenes, they are corrupting you know, politicians, not only in Colombia, but abroad as well. They're expanding quite well into Brazil. And what's, what's interesting about uh, Clan del Golfo is that they developed their own kind of security companies. And they've employed people from the army, people with military experience, people who've been trained, some, sometimes by the US uh, military. So it's a military knowledge when it comes to the physical defense, then there's the military knowledge when it comes to the digi digital defense, and they couple this together very well to kind of form a PMC, a private military company, that's very, very successful at this type of trade. I don't think the DEA can stop them at this, at this point in time. Our Colombian crew are traveling to the Gulf of Yoruba, the heartland of the clan's cocaine operation. They use the cover of the dense jungle to hide the cocaine and the vast river network to traffic onto container ships destined for Europe. To enter this area, we need the permission of the clan's regional commander and head of security. He has a reputation for violence, but is ironically nicknamed Baby. He is constantly flanked by a hitman named Flocko.
Entonces, no. Y el que en este mundo el que entra, yo creo que es muy difícil de que ah, salga. No, 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 Hey Matt, I wanted to give you an update because yesterday we were uh, filming um, Davis' interview. Okay, how'd it go? The police were going in uh, in circles and they basically stopped. So the the clan guys were about to to do a shooting to the police. So. Um, yeah, we just had to cut and just run away from there because it, it, it became really dangerous. You got out, you got out of there. Okay, that's good. Is there going to be a shipment coming out soon that we can film? Yeah, actually, we, we've just been told that uh, that they're moving ahead with a shipment, so we're going to go to the dock and try to catch that. All right, thanks, man. Bye. Where is the pista? Is this the pista? Before we get to see how the clan smuggle 100 kilos onto international bound container ships, Baby and his soldiers want to show us an air hangar previously owned by Pablo Escobar, who the clan revere. This pista is the one that Pablo fabricó Pablo traficar and entrar insumos de base de coca. This is a sitio que siempre va a estar pretendido y lo vamos a estar cuidando hasta con la sangre, porque es un predio que fue una herencia que nos dejó Pablo Escobar y la oración. En este sector se sufrió mucha violencia. Sí, hay gente enterrada. Hay... ¿Qué no eran no, estas tierras? Su, su liderazgo, ustedes han enterrado gente acá. Sí. En el... Hasta donde usted puede estar, pueden haber muerto enterrados. Exacto. Que han querido falsificar o faltar del respeto a las cosas como son y han quedado acá mismo. The war on drugs in Colombia has claimed 215,000 lives. Baby and his crew were recruited at a young age. ¿Y a qué edad te entregaron esa primera pistola? A los 17. Si usted la gana, sabe que tiene que quitar alguna vida de parte de suya por eso. Es donde usted se empieza a ganar el respeto con todo el mundo. The DEA spent 20 years and billions of dollars trying to capture Escobar and dismantle his trafficking network. 20 years on, the new owners of this airfield are trafficking just as much, if not more, cocaine. The FBI have now placed a $5 million bounty on the head of the Clan del Golfo. The clan have spotters in every town and have noticed a window of opportunity. The large police presence that was in the area last night has left. They now have two hours to move 100 kilos of cocaine downriver to a Europe-bound container ship. Como ustedes pueden ver, se le ve que no tiene tanto tiempo de uso. get spooked by word from their spotters that police have reappeared in the area, so they frantically look for a new drop-off spot.
The clan have hidden the cocaine in the dense jungle near the mouth of the river. Next, a speedboat will come to deliver it from here to a Europe-bound container ship in the Caribbean Sea. While container ships account for the route to Europe, the cocaine destined for the American market must first make it across the border with Panama. A shipment needs to leave this afternoon. Heavy border patrols by the Panamanian security forces make it incredibly difficult to cross by road. Lo que les dije, esto va a ser un vuelo con 55 kilos ya listos para su exportación eh, o su destino final. But the clan has developed a creative new way to make sure the shipment goes right over their heads. Para hacer el despegue. Es un maleto pesado, cójalo duro. Eso, papi. Yo llego a esas fincas, recojo y hago trayectos corticos, 20 kilómetros simplemente como para esquivar los retenes por medio de, del bosque y de eso. La mercancía, el cargamento más grande que he llevado son 130 kilogramos de cocaína pura y el pago han sido 60 millones de pesos colombianos. Tenía muy buenas habilidades como deportista en el deporte del parapentismo. Creo que fue representado Colombia de la mejor manera. No tenía en ese entonces las posibilidades para hacerlo, para comprarme mis equipos. Y ya esta es mi vida. Espero algún día. Half the clan's cocaine is smuggled by Mexican cartels into America. The other half, mostly concealed in container ships, goes to the European market. The Albanian mafia have opened a new route to their home country. The cocaine is then smuggled overland across Europe. They've also started coordinating direct shipments to Britain. Felixstowe is the biggest container port in Britain, and customs regularly check shipments. But with over 400 million tons of freight coming in every year, it's no surprise that an estimated 90% of the cocaine slips through the net. How do you know which ones to search? Because surely there's um, millions we're, coming through. We're Intel-led at this port. Given the, true, the number of containers that come in, we couldn't possibly hope to do all of them. So where's the concealment in here? We'll be looking at the bulkhead. This will be a temperature-controlled container. Should I try and find it and see if I can figure it out? You go for it. Wait, hang on a second. What's behind here? It doesn't look like the back. <gasps> Is this it? Well done. There's almost 120 tons of cocaine coming into the UK every year now. That's a 300% increase from 2011, and it makes the UK the biggest consumer of powder cocaine on the continent. Most of it comes in shipping containers like these. But on the way, something incredible happens. In Colombia, the package, one kilo of cocaine, is worth $1,500. By the time it gets here, it's worth $77,000. So if you were to bring a suitcase of cocaine from Colombia to here, you'd have just become a multimillionaire instantaneously. It's pretty much the most profitable substance in the entire world. The British cocaine market is worth $6.5 billion a year. We've uncovered that Colombia's Clan del Golfo are working in close alliance with the Albanian Mafia to ship tons of cocaine into Britain. We know that gangs like the Hellbanians boast about their cocaine supply through music videos and dominate distribution across British towns and cities. But who is coordinating this global network and where are the billion dollar profits going? I've come to Albania to find out. It's estimated that 50% of the economy is linked to organized crime and even top politicians here have associations with narco-traffickers. 
Artan Harsha is Albania's top investigative journalist. He's had numerous death threats. He's had to live in hiding for a lot of his life. Pra ata pjesën kryesore të të ardhurave sigurojnë jashtë dhe e kanë aktivitetin e vetë në në Britani. His work doesn't just uncover the Albanian mafia, it also exposes corruption at the highest levels of Albanian society. We're meeting Artan outside a palace that belongs to the Hairi brothers, a family of Albanian super criminals who make millions trafficking the clan del Golfo's cocaine into Britain. complex in February 2020, this palace was seized by the Albanian police following charges that the Hairi brothers kidnapped a man called Jan Prenga. Police believe Prenga's brother had stolen 285 kilograms of cocaine from the Hairi family after it landed in Portsmouth Harbor in Britain. The shipment had come from the clan del Golfo. Artan explains the police case against the Hairi brothers. Can we take a closer look? The Hairi story demonstrates how cocaine is produced in Colombia, sold in England by the Albanian mafia, and then converted into real estate in Albania. So, if this has been confiscated, why are there not government officials and police guarding it? First problem is that we have to deal with the law in Albania, and we have to deal with the law in the criminal organization. But we have to deal with the law in the object, the law in Hairi, can be a lot of politics, the personages are a lot of rights in Albania, dhe pigrisht për të shkak e shumë e vështirë për, për policinë që ajo të mbaj në se kërë e së robjikë. Um, um, I think there are some people appearing. Yeah, let's... Pjuri, mund të thosh, mund të marja të me qanta ati në fund, mund të marja në këto, sepse janë gjithë një staturë. Ok, let's... Ne jemi në në vëzhgjitë në gjithë kohë. Okay, let's go, let's go. Yeah, yeah, Let's get an ambulance. Can we finish the interview in our car? The Hairi brothers denied the charges. Can you explain the connection between the Albanian mafia groups and the clan del Golfo? This is the first time I'd learned that the clan and the Albanian mafia were equal partners, sharing the billions they make in a 50-50 split. Drug traffickers have connections at the very highest levels of the Albanian government. In 2019, 
former Minister of the Interior, Saimir Tahiri, received a three-year sentence for abuse of power. The court found he had inexplicable links to a distant cousin convicted of trafficking 3.8 tons of drugs to Italy. Tahiri was cleared of a further charge of trafficking and denies all charges. But the Court of Appeal has now ordered a retrial. To understand how Albania became so corrupt, you have to go back to 1997. That was the year that the entire economy collapsed, when it turned out two-thirds of the population had their money invested in pyramid schemes operated by companies supported by the government. In the chaos that followed, criminal gangs took control of several Albanian cities and opened up the military's arsenals to the public. Hundreds of millions in currency was stolen from government treasuries. You look at, at the 90s, you look at the fall of the communism. These are lawless times in all over Eastern Europe, but in particular in a country like Albania that started off in a very bad place uh, too, you know, because communism was a different breed in, in Albania. People were starving in Albania. That's the point where criminals really started getting a grasp of the society because the government was not able to govern at all. After the fall of the communism, the people who were working in the security forces of the state, in the intelligence services, found themselves on their own. Now, what they had was the know-how. They knew exactly how to set up an offshore type of company in Luxembourg or how to open a bank account in Switzerland. They had contacts in all these places, informants that they built over time. So this is when organized crime started developing on the back of the former communist secret services. They actually started taking over entire economies. We have members of the, of the parliament connected to organized crime. In Albania, unfortunately, it started with the local level, mayors of towns, of cities, connected straight to organized crime, elected because organized crime is backing them, and you have criminals themselves getting elected. It's why you see politicians, you know, on the right of the spectrum, you know, cooperating with the leftists without any, any problem, because in the end you don't have left and right. So politics is just a, a cover-up many times for the real business that happens behind the scenes. We're trying to speak to one of the Albanian Mafia's top smugglers to see how this endemic corruption allows them to transport cocaine across Europe. In terms of him, is he under much police surveillance? Yes. yes. From the Albanian police? We can get to the border between Albania and Montenegro in about two to three hours. We finally managed to get in touch with someone high up in the Albanian Mafia. He's one of the top smugglers in the Balkans, so he traffics cocaine and arms for the Albanian Mafia. He's called Lucky. He's actually one of the most wanted men in Europe. And because he's under complete surveillance in Albania by the police, we're having to travel across the border into Montenegro to meet with him. Once through the border, we're told to pack down our cameras and follow Lucky's car to another location. So how did you get the nickname Lucky? I got shot here plenty of times. I'm alive. Plenty of my friends. They dead. My brother is dead. They shot him 13 times. It's not easy. This life is, forget about it. I will not like to do my kids that. Well, once you go in it, you can get out. You understand? Yeah, so the Albanians killed your brother, but you still work for them? Yeah. Two years ago, they killed my friend. They killed him. They killed his wife. They killed his wife? Yeah, with the stone. That's the, that's the law there. They shoot him in the back. They killed his wife with the stone. Who, who killed him? Albanians because he saw some money. So is that one of the main ways that the Albanian Mafia keeps hold of its power by murdering people who try to take over? Once you give Bessa, that's it. You have to die. You cannot give up the Bessa. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Are you always carrying a weapon on you? I have to.
Have you ever had to kill someone yourself? I don't like to answer that. Have you ever had a gun battle with the police? Yeah. Can you tell me that story? Please, no. Because he shot himself, you know. The police shot himself? Yeah. By accident? By accident, I don't know. Right. Did he definitely shoot himself? Or is that just the story? Let's go to the next story. What, what do you usually traffic across borders? Show him the video. Yeah. God bless Albania. Have you ever bought cocaine from the Clan del Golfo in Colombia? Of course. We keep good relationship, otherwise there's no hook. It goes from Colombia with the big boats, sometimes come to Albania. From here we go, Montenegro, Serbia, Bosnia, across the borders. Oh, we pay the police sometimes, you know. We pay big companies with the trucks, you understand? All across Europe is corruption. Politician, police, I had to take it uh, six kilos from Albania to Croatia. I passed one border. Somebody snitched me, and they, they catch me 10 kilometers from the border. And they catch us four. We could not skate, could not shoot, because there was like 50 cops. I only did two years and a half for six kilos. So it was quite easy for you to pay your way out of a prison? Not me, somebody else. Someone you worked for? Yeah. For six kilos, only two years and a half. Think about it. Yeah. He was very on edge and was very reluctant to give any detail about things like why he's been the victim of murder attempts, why his brother was murdered, whether he's killed anyone. But the picture he painted of Europe was one of corruption. Basically, it's not some high-tech method that smugglers use to feed the massive demand for tons and tons of cocaine across this continent. It's money. They just pay officials in every country. They pay politicians, border officials, shipping companies. And the profit is so huge that paying off officials is easy for them. After smugglers like Lucky transport the cocaine, an army of super-fast Albanian couriers based in every major European city distribute it. And they're all controlled from here. Artan has provided for us a source who is basically someone who has worked in London for a very powerful Albanian mafia family as a drug dealer for many years, and he's now come back to Albania. So we're gonna meet him on the terrace over here. Can you tell me a little bit about your job in London? How is the group that you were working for able to get cocaine delivered so quickly to customers all over London? It's 10 person and 10 cars. He's working for one number one. Pro organizer family of family Chapia. The Chapia family run an international drug trafficking network, and police suspect members of the Chapia family are connected to dozens of murders. The Albanian prime minister was photographed standing next to the head of the Chapia family, but when asked on Albanian TV, he refused to answer questions about any ties. London-based street gangs like the Helbanians get all the press, but it's families like this that hold all the power. How have these Albanian groups managed to take over the cocaine trade in London? Do you think that the consumers, the people who actually use cocaine in London, would care if they knew that your family were being threatened back in Albania? I want to know how so many young Albanians end up in this terrifying servitude. Around 70% of Albanians in prison in the UK are recruited from the country's impoverished northern regions. 
If you're in London and you have an Albanian Coke dealer, there's a high chance that they come from Hoss, which is in the northern mountains of Albania, and it's one of the poorest districts in the country. The average salary in Albania is around 330 euros a month. Here, it's even lower. A lot of young people who live here aim to leave and work in the cocaine market abroad. And the biggest cocaine market is the UK. Zamir is the only person from his class who hasn't left Haas to go to the UK. Have many of the people who've left Haas to go work in England ended up working in the drug trade? Are they working for the Albanian Mafia in London? Have you heard any of the Albanian gangster rap that's coming out of cities like London? Do you find the lifestyle that the Albanians advertise in their music videos appealing? Really? How realistic do you think that lifestyle is? Do you think that the music videos are an accurate portrayal of what reality as a cocaine dealer in London is? How much money is it to get to London? The Albanian Mafia are ready and waiting to smuggle Zamir to London. And when he gets here, to entrap him in an exploitative and dangerous criminal economy that's almost impossible to escape. But with little employment in Haas and the siren call of a wealthy lifestyle selling cocaine on London's streets, it's difficult to see why people like Zamir don't take the chance. These problems might seem far away to people actually doing cocaine in London, but the city of London is the global money laundering capital of the drug trade, with hundreds of billions of dirty pounds passing through here. The Colombian cartels, the Albanian mafia families, the cocaine users in London, and the banks of Western Europe are all connected. They're all part of the same economy. Bankers are extremely important in the criminal game. They created a ready-made system that was handed like on a plate to criminals saying, do you have some money to launder? We have this oppor uh, opportunity for you. We do have this great opportunity. We do have the companies. We, we do have the bank accounts. We do have the money channels. We do have the invoices. And this is how you need to use our services. So the criminals don't even have to move at all. Everything is just a few clicks away. 